What I've been doing with bears and OSHA, uh, there's kind of two topics I'll be covering today, but uh, uh, I'd like to introduce the idea of World Park. Uh, World Park is a strategic plan for nature conservation, and it's a way to take our whole planet back and make it back into a healthy condition. Uh, this really is an important thing right today because you know, we know that if you want to heal a person, you can't just heal an eye and an ear and a toe and a finger. Um, but what nature conservationists are trying to do, and I've worked with them for 30 years, is they're trying to protect the planet's nature by, connect it by uh, a little park here, a little park over there, and, that, and it's not going to work. We just found out it won't work. So I'm proposing another strategic plan, and that is that we take those national parks, those mini parks, natural areas, wilderness areas, and begin expanding them outward in every direction in order to restore our planet back into health condition. Gradually, true, but it's very doable. Um, <clears throat> the good news is nature's reaching out for nature all over the world. Uh, Propagules are being sent out in every direction, and uh, many of the indigenous people who are living sustainably with nature for thousands of years with high biodiversity and a good quality of life have, met, have a technology that allows them to actually do that. We don't have that technology, maybe a few of you do, uh, but a lot of us do not have that technology. And we've fragmented uh, about 85% of our planet right now, and it's not in a very healthy condition. Um, <coughs> My little piece here I'm going to talk about a little bit is the uh, is One Planet OSHA. I'm going to talk about how to uh, bring OSHA into cultivation. This is a project I've worked on for many, many years, and I've had a lot of support, as you can see. Um, <clears throat> the goal, really, are to cultivate, protect, and restore OSHA. Why? To take pressure off of the wild populations, and also so humans can benefit from OSHA. Those of you who use OSHA know how amazing it is. It works really well for colds and flus, upper respiratory infections, many other methods, <coughs> uh, many other uh, uses. Uh, I started this work back in 1980, uh, in the early 80s, and uh, it was the holy grail to try to bring ocean cultivation. Nobody had ever done it. Many, many people had tried. And, and for the first few years as an undergraduate, I got pretty much 0.001% germination. There's a reason. Um, we used every method known to science to break dormancy and bring uh, the plant into uh, it to grow, but it wouldn't grow. But little by little, through the years, uh, I finally, and as you can see, that's about a 25 or 30 year span, uh, I now have very robust uh, germination of OSHA. Not only do I have it germinating, I have it pre uh, preparation for uh, growth, and I've done tens of thousands of different trials. I've, ha I've had, luckily, some very good funding for this. Uh, in the later parts, in the early parts, I had no funding. Uh, but uh, what I do is I cultivate the soil. Um, oh, heavens, what's this? Oh, great. I do not know how to stop this from happening, guys. There's a button in the bottom right hand corner. I know, but uh, I have to come out of the program to do it. <clears throat> Let's see what happens. I just hit cancel. Yeah, I'll hit cancel, thanks. Um, and so. Uh, Little by little, uh, by doing uh, field trials, I was able to begin to get seedlings growing. This is a pretty advanced stage. And uh, uh, after thousands of experiments, finally, uh, and this is number 754, I was able to get OSHA to grow. And through the years, look, now I have whole fields of OSHA. And really, I can grow an unlimited amount. What is that? Oh, oh I can't believe it. It looks like we may have technical difficulties. Okay, thanks. Um, and the OSHA is very robust. It's growing very well. It's extremely healthy. Chemical trials have shown that the cultivated OSHA the cultivars are using are chemically identical to wild OSHA, which is really exciting. And as you can see, the plants are extremely healthy. Um, at this point, my family and I have uh, a, the ability to grow pretty much an unlimited amount of OSHA. So I'm really excited about this. This is a turnaround. It's going to help, um, you know, whoever, I never dreamed it would take me 30 years to get this off the ground to make it work. When I started as an undergraduate, I thought, oh, I'll, put, I'll dedicate a whole year to this. <laughs> well, as time went on, uh, it, t it took out a lot more time than that. The problem with OSHA is this going extinct. In all the places I went to herbaria, and I found all the places where OSHA used to be abundant that are very represented. And in those areas, 
uh, almost in every case now, uh, at the time of this census, it was rare or extinct or extirpated, if you like. Um, so uh, at the time, uh, recently, the only verified sources of OSHA were wild populations. And so again, I wanted to cultivate it to, to, uh, to help this process. That's a little bit of chemistry. Um, there are also some good ways of sustainable harvest of OSHA. If you really want to harvest OSHA, I, this is the way I like best. My Navajo uh, friends and, and my youth friends say what you can do is just brush away a little bit of the soil right at the top of the crown, down an inch or two, and then come in. They, they use flint, but you can just take a little piece of the OSHA, a little piece of the crown, about this much. And this is the least invasive of all sustainable harvest uh, techniques that I have ever heard so far. I've, I've used many, many different kinds, but you can you know, visit many plants with a really minimal impact by just harvesting small pieces of the top of the crowns. So I'm really excited about this. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit about the natural history of OSHA. It, it grows from Colorado down to Arizona. It grows only in the Rocky Mountains. Many animals use OSHA for medicine or for food. Or for food, these are mostly the ones that use it for food. Um, the Native Americans have a legend, however, that tells that the bears originally taught them how to use OSHA for medicine. And I was really intrigued by this. This was a, a, a mountain way chant uh, ceremony. And, uh, and I also noticed among many different sympatric uh, indigenous people that the word bear came up a lot. It was bear root, bear medicine, bear plant, plant that the bear uses. And so I, would, I really wanted to explore the biological basis of these legends and so I set up some controlled studies. I work with bears of different ages and in different places and uh, <clears throat> I wanted to know, is it true? Are people learning from bears? And are bears it, learn, using the plant for medicine? So here's one of my black bears holding a piece of OSHA in its mouth. What they do generally is they hunker down and begin chewing a little bit on it and they make a paste. I've also worked with giant Kodiak bears. These are brown bears. Uh, they're sympatric with some genera of OSHA, and they hold the plant in their mouth, they hunker down, they chew it. They might swallow a little bit, but they make a lot of paste out of it. And uh, with the paste, they begin to rub it over their fur. They rub it over their shoulders, they rub it in their faces, especially in their cheek patches right here. Then they shake their head vigorously, creating an aerosol, and the aerosol falls down into their back, and then they rub it against rocks and trees. No kidding, I've got some footage of this, I can see it. Uh, it's an amazing phenomenon. Um, I just feel so lucky to have been a part of this research. And here's them, one of them uh, rubbing. At one point I began to work with uh, two bears. These bears happened to be named Ma and Pa. They lived together in a fairly dysfunctional relationship, uh, kind of growling <laughs> each other a lot. And, uh, um, and, w and when I came in to work with them, so I'm going to go one more over here so we can get this one. Uh, they, uh, they, they grabbed about 25 years. I just threw in a big piece of OSHA. There she is with it. That's actually a huge. If you heard the bear keeper, you can see it. It happens very quickly. She had already chewed on it. Now she's uh, she shook her hand, created the aerosol. She's going under the aerosol now. Um, had gone under the aerosol. Now she's rubbing. I'm about to give a big piece to Pa. Um, if you heard the bear keeper, he's been seeing his whole life with bears, and as he said, he's never seen a behavior like that before. And that's consistently what I hear wherever I go. This is a unique behavior that's stimulated by some of the pharmacological activity, apparently, inside of the ocean. And there she is, rubbing, rubbing. She'll even snort and kind of create a, a mist. And uh, this mist uh, helps penetrate in the skin. She has many different ways to get that uh, into, her, into her fur. Um, what happened uh, after this is that uh, I gave Pa a piece. There she is, doing the snorting. I gave Pa a piece of the OSHA, and, uh, and, and he didn't need it very much. He just rubbed a little bit on it, and then he took a piece of the OSHA um, and just set it in front of him. Well, Ma, meanwhile, we later found out she had chronic arthritis, began, uh, you know, had used all of her OSHA, and she really came and begged me for more. Well, I couldn't give her more. It was a controlled experiment. So what I did is uh, I just kind of held my breath, and, and uh, what happened next was amazing. Pa took his piece of OSHA. Crawled, went down his knees, crawled up to her, dropped it right in front of her. 
she took the OSHA, she ran up, and she rubbed it all over her fur more and more, and then look what happened. She came down and licked him right in the nose. There it is. <laughs> so there was a complete change of behavior, you see, as a result of the OSHA. We later found out that OSHA has oxytocin in it. Um, oxytocin, as many of us know, is the love medicine. And so there, there was a transformation of behavior in the case of OSHA. And OSHA sometimes is related to the English lovage. The word of love, respect, and, and bears often go together uh, among, <coughs> among legendary uh, stories. And they nestled together for quite a while there. I've also worked with uh, little bears, but that, I'm just giving you a brief glimpse into the story. Uh, I, I, a life goal of mine was to take uh, pictures of bears in the wild using OSHA. And uh, uh, my first chance, this is my ranch right here in Steamboat Springs. And this is all bear country up here. So I set up some arenas. Here's one of my uh, camera setups. And I thought maybe in my whole lifetime I might get one uh, bear interacting with OSHA. Um, some of you have seen a little bit of this, but I'm repeating this because we have both societies together and a lot of you have never seen this, so forgive me on the repeats. But uh, the first bear that came in was this big bear. Uh, he came in and just kind of wandered through what I call an arena. This is a little arena that has OSHA in it. Notice this big tree is going to play a role in the story. Um, what happened is this bear came in and it began rubbing on the tree. It walked right over to an OSHA plant. There it is. It's eating the OSHA plant. And then it goes behind the tree, does something, I don't know, I wish I had more cameras there. Uh, it looks like it's probably rubbing. Um, and uh, then it goes out of the arena for a moment or two. Let's see what time we have. Okay, a few more minutes. Um, then it comes back into the arena. It looks, <coughs> it's gonna look right over here at the OSHA plant. There it goes, glanced at it, walks up to the tree, and then begins to do the rubbing behavior. Um, in animal behavior, what I was looking for was rubbing in association with wild OSHA. So this was a really terrific, uh, this is a really great breakthrough. Um, uh, it's the first time in history that we've ever seen a wild bear interacting with OSHA in a rubbing behavior. Uh, this is another one that happened at night. It's just another rubbing behavior, kind of nice. Uh, then, this is one of my favorites, a baby bear cub. We just got this footage, uh, nobody's seen this one yet. But here's a little striped bear, and it's rubbing on a tree that now has OSHA on the side of the tree. So clearly, there's a continuous chain of, of uh, behaviors, which is kind of fascinating. So what is, what's going on with this ecologically? What's going on with this is going to affect our world of ethnobotany? Well, it looks like that OSHA is a really important indicator species, but also it seems like it's protecting nature. Um, also, OSHA is keeping the bears healthy, and we know that bears are a keystone species. They keep nature healthy. Well, if nature's healthy, that means we get those equal ecological ecosystem benefits that trickle down to us. So it's really important to keep our OSHA populations as healthy as we possibly can. And it looks like um, that there is kind of a triad happening between bears and humans and OSHA and nature. And this is a part of the links of life that are so important to us and to protect our medicinal plants. And I'm calling this an ethnobiological cycle of life between OSHA, bear, and humans. And this, these are the kinds of things we can look for with the species that we study in our natural ecosystems. So it's really fun to do that. Um, so I feel like I've achieved some of my goals. Um, I have taken pressure off of wild populations of OSHA. I do think that we can, we're in a position to be able to save uh, the natural areas that OSHA grows in, yeah, better and better now. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, what, I've, what are my next talk is going to be about, if you happen to be able to go to that one, is more about World Park. But what's happening is um, there's kind of a spontaneous upwelling of people around the world protecting nature and restoring nature and thereby protecting medicinal plants in our, uh, in our world. And so uh, what World Park's goal is, uh, is, as big as it may be, I just got invited to the United Nations to talk about it informally. Uh, I'm really excited that this time just got a sabbatical to work and write a book about World Park. So stay tuned um, if, I, if I can figure out how to do all those things. Um, <laughs> it could be pretty interesting. Um, but my hope is that by doing projects like these, and people all over the world are doing projects like these, that we can gradually restore our planet back into a healthy condition, just the way we've learned to restore our bodies back to a healthy condition. So, that's it.
increase germination? Uh, well, um, that, this is the Society of Economic Botany, and, and one thing I give away to everyone is my story, and I give away my, uh, my technology for World Park. But as far as that, that germination part, it took me like 30 years to do, so I'm hoping to license that with some company that ethically wants to uh, grow OSHA. And so, that, I hate to give that answer, but I, I am pretty generous, but I can't give it all away. That's how I would get my... We're working out. with the use of candidates here. Are you? And, uh, I'd love to talk with you about that. And it's, you know, the germination, I think it's been good. I, I'm not doing oh. the study, it's over at the Arboretum, but oh. uh, if you get a chance to go on that tour, you can go and enjoy it as well. I would okay. very much like that. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yes? Are there similar spurs or associations with pairs that are used to come from uh, gray eye? I haven't heard any uh, direct ones with gray eye. That's on the West Coast generally. And, uh, but people are working with it and using it medically, and it cultivates quite easily. It just doesn't have the strange bottleneck. Yes. Since we have the heroic trio now talked about here, gray eye, candidates, and yeah. like what's the what's the current biochemical knowledge? Well, there is variation in chemistry. I've only done chemistry on porter eye, uh, but what I'm hearing is there's conservation within the whole entire genus Ligusticum of uh, some of the volatile compounds and some of the ligustrolytes and and, uh, and terpenes, but I don't know the details on that. You have to ask that. It's a good question. Though. What does what is active besides oxytocin? Uh, well, we have ligustrolides that are in there. Um, the ligustrolides apparently are active, but uh, again, I'm not a chemist, and, and I'm, I would love to learn more about that. I'm hoping at some point we can uh, learn a lot more. I don't know why the bears want it on their fur. Well, uh, it is fragrant, but they don't rub other fragrant things on their fur that way, so it remains somewhat of a mystery. You know, uh, we know that in some, uh, in some genera we have literally hundreds of uh, different chemicals and synergistic interactions among them, so this is probably something like that. Well, some primates rub uh, anti-flea and anti-fungal stuff on their fur. Yeah, I've been filming them too, and that's amazing. Jane Goodall heard about my research, and so she became intrigued and started working with the chimps and found out that they're using Aspilia in a non-food-like behavior, which has uh, thiorubrin in it and may have, uh, may, may be stimulating some anti-cancer uh, benefits. Yeah? I'm living in the Valley of the Angels and the Reaches here, and I seem to be on a bare highway. My I have not heard of one, but bears do love to scratch. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. just something that's about their fur that is love to. Yeah, but the thing is, nobody's looked at that really closely. So if you were in a position to see what they did before they scratched, I'd love to hear about it. You may discover something very interesting. Well, they took the topical application. I mean, that's common in you know, many traditional systems. The spraying and blowing of the... You know, topically, so that, yeah. that just makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's you know, a, if you got high, you got to rub it in. Yeah, that's right. I mean, this is biomimicry at its best. You know, it's uh, really, and it is no pharmacognosy, of course, because it's animals knowing how to use a pharmacol pharmacologically active substance appropriately, seemingly appropriately. Yeah. Uh, a grad student of Silver Damson and I once worked out that it's pretty obvious that human perfume comes. It start, if you look at what people find really good perfume everywhere, it's like lavender and rose and stuff like that. They're intensely antibacterial and antifungal mm -hmm. volatile oils. Uh -huh. And it's pretty obvious that this comes from the primate. Uh, yeah, there's, a, there's evolution. medication behavior. Oh, yeah. And there's evolutionary benefit by having, and biological benefit by having these kind of behaviors. It's a wonderful uh, kind of subtlety. Yes. I just wanted to mention uh, Herbal Gram a few years ago had a comparison of some of the music constitutions. Yeah. So if you're looking at different chemical compounds, it was That was really good. I yeah. interviewed that one, and I was very happy to work with that. Thank you. Yeah, it might be on the AD, the American Botanical Council website. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mark Blumenthal's uh, magazine. We have to sign this. Oh, <laughs> is that my release? <laughs>